My name is Scott Harden. I'm part of the vessel preservation crew here at the USS Silverside Submarine Museum. Uh, we're located on the west side of Michigan in Muskegon, Michigan. And we are the home of the USS Silverside's submarine, which is a World War II era submarine. And what's really cool about the Silversides and really special is that the Silversides is actually the most successful surviving submarine that exists today. Um, in addition to the Silversides, we also have the Coast Guard Cutter McLean, which is a Prohibition era vessel. Um, it's 125 feet long and she has literally seen the world. Um, she was stationed in Alaska during World War II and it is also a World War II veteran. So my job is to keep both of these vessels preserved uh, so future generations can enjoy them as much as we are today. And, can, and not only can future generations enjoy them, but future generations can also use them to learn and to experience what those who fought for our country went through. Now both of our vessels are available uh, to spend the night on which is a really, really neat experience. Um, you get to sleep in the original racks that the men who served on the Silversides and the McLeans slept in. You get to experience the, the smells and the movement and all of the atmosphere that comes with an original World War II vessel. Open to family members, it's open to church groups, scout groups, uh, any sort of group that you have. Uh, you're welcome to call our museum and schedule a, uh, an overnight on board either one of our vessels. The forward torpedo room, it is the only room that has an escape chamber where you can actually get out of the submarine normally. So the chamber is up above the torpedo room, up above the pressure hall, and this chamber was designed to fit about six guys at a time. They could equalize the pressure, flood the compartment, and then they could safely, in theory, swim out of the submarine if they had that chance. Uh, so forward of the torpedo room, forward torpedo room, there are some big tanks, and these are what we call impulse air tanks, okay? And these impulse air tanks are basically pumped up to 600 PSI, and they are used to actually fire the torpedo, start the firing process of the torpedo in the torpedo tubes themselves. So the forward torpedo room, uh, for one, I always like to mention that it's called the forward torpedo room and not just the torpedo room because there are torpedo rooms on board the Silversides. The forward torpedo room was home to 16 men uh, during the Silversides operational patrols. It was also home or the storage place for 16 live torpedoes. Um, so the men who lived in that compartment also had to live next to the uh, ammunition, basically the torpedoes that were used to sink the ships. The torpedo compartment also is the home to the officers only head and shower. So the 16 men who lived in the four torpedo room were not allowed to use the head or the shower that were located in that compartment. Instead, they had to go all the way back to the enlisted crew's head and shower to use the bathroom and the facilities. Located in the after part of the four torpedo room are two active sonar heads, okay? So the silver sides is sort of interesting because there would have been several sonar men posted in several different compartments, actually two compartments on board the silver sides itself. So in addition to the torpedo men working in the forward torpedo room, there would have also been a sonar man on duty in the forward torpedo room. As you're walking through the torpedo room aft, you will find yourself in the officer's country. Moving aft into the officer's country, which is technically called the forward battery compartment, you will find where the officers would have lived, uh, slept, ate, and uh, basically uh, served during their, when they were not on duty, this is where they would have lived. One interesting thing about the officer's country is the wardroom, which is basically where the officers would have eaten, uh, they could have played cards, they could have had meetings and things like that. Um, but during one patrol on board the USS Silversides, a man had his appendix taken out on the very table inside the wardroom. Although that sounds interesting in itself, more interesting is the fact that the Silversides didn't have a trained doctor on board. They didn't have proper medical equipment, and they certainly didn't have the training to do surgery on board a submarine because it actually was against regulation to do surgery on board a submarine, so it was never expected. Um, however, they had no option. Either the man was going to die, or they were gonna take his appendix out. Um, so they chose to take his appendix out. They did make a movie, <laughs> Destination Tokyo, 
uh, which was released actually while the war was still going, portrayed a scene of a man had his appendix taken out, uh, or a man having, having his appendix taken out on board a submarine, and that is directly from the Silver Sides. But the really cool part about it is, is they overcame all of this stuff. The man survived, he lived to be very old, and what's really, really cool is in our archives we actually have pictures of the man who had his appendix taken out and the man who took his appendix out, their, name were, their names were George Platter and Thomas Moore, uh, on board the Silver Sides in the 1990s here in Muskegon, okay? So what's really cool about that is there was only three of these surgeries ever performed on submarines during World War II. The Silver Sides was the first, and the Silver Sides was really the only one that didn't have adequate or proper training. Because of the Silver Sides, crews started to be trained more on simple surgeries such as taking your appendix out. Perhaps the most important part of the officer's quarters is, like I mentioned before, the fact that it's really the forward battery compartment. So beneath the deck or beneath the walking floor in officer's quarters would have been 126 battery cells. Each one of these battery cells weighed about 1,650 pounds, would have held about 32 gallons of electrolyte, and would have been about four or three to four volts, okay? So what they would do is they would wire all of these cells together to create what we call one battery, all right? The Silver Sides had two batteries on board. And later on, we'll talk a little bit more about the after battery. But the batteries on board the Silver Sides were extremely important because when the submarine was submerged, the engines, the diesel engines, could not be run. So the submarine relied 100% on battery power for everything from propulsion to the lights that were on inside the boat. Moving aft in the, in the uh, forward battery or the uh, officer's country, you'll find the yeoman's office. Uh, the yeoman is basically the secretary of the sub. Anything that needed to be recorded, such as the patrol logs, would have been done by the yeoman. Now, the Silver Sides yeoman is somewhat famous because he was well known for not following Navy regulation in terms of uniforms. Um, and the reason is the yeoman was kind of special because he always, while they were on patrol, wore a Hawaiian shirt. Um, so he kind of became famous for his Hawaiian shirts, as tacky as they were. Moving aft from the yeoman's office, you'll find yourself through one more watertight door into the control room. The control room is an extremely complicated room, but if you think about it in simple terms, think of it almost as the brain of the submarine. So a lot of the systems throughout the entire submarine were centrally controlled from the control room itself. For instance, the diving and surfacing of the submarine were controlled from the control room. The steering or the helmsman would have been either in the control room or up above the control room, which we'll talk about in a second. The men who were controlling the dive planes, which were essentially wings that folded out of the hull of the submarine to control its pitch while it was underwater, were controlled from the control room. The control room is interesting because it has a level not only underneath it, but also above it. So we'll start with what's underneath the control room, underneath your feet. So underneath the control room is what's called the pump room. Now the pump room is basically the home to anything that's a pump on board the Silver Sides. So in the pump room you will find primarily two 50 horsepower four stage air compressors. So this is what they would use to pump up all of the compressed air that was used throughout the entire submarine. The 50 horsepower compressors were four stage and capable of about 3000 PSI, which is what they used to blow the ballast tanks. Also in the pump room are air conditioning plants, believe it or not. There are two big air conditioning compressors down in the pump room. Everyone gets surprised when you tell them that the Silver Sides is air conditioned, okay? And in fact, the Silver Sides was air conditioned. However, the air conditioning on board the Silver Sides was not necessarily intended to keep the crew comfortable. That was just sort of an offshoot of it. The air conditioning on board the Silver Sides was intended to keep the electrical equipment comfortable. <laughs> you think about condensation that arises between temperature differentials, and then you think that we have a metal tube that's really hot inside going underneath cold water, we're gonna have a lot of condensation that builds up. So essentially the air conditioning system on board the Silver Sides was designed as a dehumidifier. It would keep the condensation down inside the submarine, keep the humidity low, and as an offshoot, it was also help keep the crew a little cool. Crew members were a lot like more likely to volunteer for a service that was air conditioned, even if it didn't keep them cool, um, than they were for 
to be told that they're going to serve on a submarine that's basically 120 degrees all the time. Uh, whether it was true or not is a different story. One of the other most important things inside the, the pump room is what's called the trim pump. So and this is located in the port side, very aft of the control room. And the trim pump is extremely important because if you think about how a submarine operates underneath the water, you have to keep in mind that when a submarine is submerged, it's very easy to throw it out of trim and balance. And what I mean by that is if 20 men from the stern or from the aft part of the submarine were to walk towards the forward end, well, the forward end just became heavy and the aft end just became light. And they had to have a way of compensating for that. So down in the, in the pump room is the trim pump. And basically what this is, is an internal pump that pumps water from one special trim tank, internal tank, to another tank to compensate for weight changes internally inside the submarine. Well, what would happen is, is after the boat submerged, a man from the engine room would actually come forward to the control room and he would man the trim pump because they didn't need as many guys in the engine room when they were submerged because the engines weren't running. So he would come forward to the control room, he would man the trim pump, take orders from the diving officer to compensate for trim um, adjustments while they were underneath the water. As you come out of the control room and we go up, you'll find yourself back in the main level of the control room, but above your head is also another level called the conning tower. And it's, it's a really interesting place to be, but once you go up in the conning tower, you also realize that it's an extremely small place. So it's an eight foot diameter tube, basically, welded on top of the main pressure hull. And so the conning tower is the home to several things everyone always wants to see are the periscopes. Conning tower houses two periscopes. Periscopes were used for basically searching the surface while the submarine was submerged. But the reason they had two periscopes is because they had different jobs. Main periscope or observation periscope is a very large periscope. It has very good optics. But the problem with it is, is it's very easy to spot from the surface from other enemy ships or planes or anything like that. The other periscope that you will find in the conning tower is called the attack periscope. And essentially the attack periscope still does the same job as the main periscope, although it is used only for sinking ships or when they know the enemy is around. The optics are not as good, but it is also specially designed to work with the fire control system on board the submarine to help them properly sink ships. Other than that, up inside the conning tower are a lot of other important things. For instance, we have radar equipment, we have more sonar equipment, we have a chart table, and perhaps the most important is we have the primary helm, so the boat's main steering wheel. Most people think that the helm down in the control room is where the boat was actually steered from, and that's not technically true, it could be. Generally, the helmsman would be on duty in the conning tower taking orders directly from the XO or the captain or whoever else would have been in the conning tower. Now directly above the conning tower is the bridge. Okay, so there is a hatch that leads up to the bridge area of the conning tower which you can actually see behind me. Another thing about the silver sides that most people don't realize is that it would have been on the surface a lot of its time. Simply because its biggest limitation was the fact that it did not have a system to create oxygen, nor did it have a system to scrub CO2. So the only air that boat had when it went submerged, or when it was submerged, was what it brought with it. Okay, so there would have always been, when they were on the surface, men stationed in the bridge area. Also probably a pretty privileged job to be stationed in the bridge area, because a lot of the men that were on board the Silver Sides probably never saw the light of day, for the entire length of the patrol. So being up in the bridge, even if it was cold or windy or nasty, probably wasn't such a bad gig. Now if you make your way back down from the conning tower back into the control room and you start walking aft, you will notice on the port side is the radio shack or the radio room. Inside the radio room of the Silver Sides is all original World War II radio equipment. You can only imagine if you look inside that compartment nowadays, it looks rudimentary to us, but in 1940 to 1945, it was really state of the art. All of the equipment in the radio room is, is powered by vacuum tubes. They did not have such a thing as a transistor in 1940 to 1945. So there was no solid state electronics. And one of the attributes or one of the offshoots of a vacuum tube obviously is heat. So if you look around inside that radio shack, and you take a look at how big the amplifiers and the radios are and you think how many vacuum tubes would have been in each one of those units and then you think holy cow each one of these things put off puts off 
a ton of heat um, with all of that equipment running. There's simply nowhere for the heat to go. As you walk aft out of the radio shack through one more watertight door, you find yourself in the cruise mess. And immediately on the port side, you, you probably notice that there's a small galley or kitchen. The thing about the galley on board the Silversides is that uh, all the food for all 80 men was prepared in that small galley or kitchen. So you have to imagine the frenzy of the cooks working inside there, you know, trying to prepare these meals for hungry sailors who are stuck in a metal tube to keep them happy it must have been something. It's my favorite part about the galley on board the Silver Sides is the fact that it has a, uh, a deep fryer. You think about <laughs> the using a deep fryer on a vessel that's not very stable to start out with and, and trying not to burn yourself. These guys must have been some pretty brave cooks to even attempt it. They did their jobs and, and, and you know, the galley is one of the most important places on board the submarine because a lot of guys joined submarine service simply because they were guaranteed really good food. They were actually guaranteed the best food in the military. Um, so these guys had to live up to that guarantee or that promise per se. The, the galley is the home to the second most important piece of equipment on board the submarine, and that being the coffee pot. Coffee was available to the sailors on board the Silver Sides 24 hours a day, seven days a week, absolutely no exceptions. And I always get asked the question, well, if the, if the, the coffee pot is the, most, or the second most important piece of equipment on board the submarine, what's the first? Well, obviously, I'm not a submariner, but I would have to say that probably the most important piece of equipment on board the submarine is the part that keeps the water out, whatever that may be at any given time. Coffee was extremely important to the men who served on board the boat. As you make your way aft into the cruise mess, you'll find tables and chairs. Uh, there are four tables. What's really interesting, and it always throws people off, is when you tell them how many men were jammed in this small compartment at each meal. So 24 men would have eight at a time inside the compartment. That equates to six men per table or three men per bench. And now, if, if you personally sit in any one of these benches, you think, well, how could six men sit at this little table? But it's just what they had to deal with, you know? If you think about the amount of space on board a submarine like the Silver Sides, and you think of, about the fact that the Silver Sides had an 80-man crew, and then you put all that together and you look around, there's not a lot of space for anything. And one question I always like to talk to the kids when I bring kids on tour is the fact that where do they keep all the food that all of these 80 men would have eaten over the course of maybe 50 days, 60 days, or up to 70 days at sea? And the answer to that question is, is really simple and it's simply everywhere, okay? So there was no wasted space on board that submarine whatsoever. Every square inch of extra space likely would have been jam-packed with food and supplies. As you're walking aft in the, in the cruise mess, you'll find a hatch that leads up to the main walking deck of the Silver Sides. It's often referred to as the potato hatch because some submarines would keep potatoes inside that hatchway. But the technical name for that hatch is the after battery hatch. We talked about the officer's country and the forward end of the boat being the forward battery compartment. Well, the technical name for the mess deck and the cruise quarters behind the mess deck is the after battery compartment. Underneath the deck in the cruise quarters, the main cruise sleeping quarters, would have been another 126 battery cells that constituted one more battery. So the Silver Sides had a total of two batteries, but 252 battery cells on board. As you're walking aft, you will see that there are many beds inside the cruise compartment. So there's a total of 34 beds currently inside the cruise quarters. And this is where a good majority of the enlisted crew members would have slept, would have lived. This was their home. And that's hard for a lot of us to understand too is, you know, it's cool to walk through the submarine and it's, it's cool to see the different things, but when you think about it, in terms of this wasn't just you know a ship it was really these guys home it gives you greater appreciation for what they lived with um, I certainly don't have any fr friends that I would wanna work next to eat next to sleep next to go to the bathroom next to and have no outlet for you know up to 70 days at a time um, but all of the men on board the Silver Sides experienced this every time they went on patrol so that you know it, it only gives you more respect for what they had to deal with. So as you walk aft through the crew's main sleeping quarters or the after battery compartment, you will find on the starboard side there are two more heads, um, toilets, and as I mentioned at the beginning, 
the guys who lived in the forward torpedo room weren't allowed to use the head or shower in the forward end because that was the officers. So those guys, including every other enlisted guy, would have to make their way all the way aft and find and use these two heads. On the port side of the after battery compartment is the showers and sinks for the crew. Now, when we talk about showers on board a submarine, it only makes sense that the men would take showers because you have 80 men living inside a metal tube where it's hot and it's sweaty and there's diesel fumes and there's food cooking. So it makes sense that they take showers, but the thing that you have to realize is, is they didn't take salt water showers. So water was not um, expendable or, or, or water was extremely rationed is a better term, I guess you could say for this. Um, so the men on board submarines generally would take a shower no more often than maybe once every two weeks or so. Um, and it's not a luxurious shower like you know you might think today either. Your once every two week shower might be 30 seconds long where you get yourself wet enough to put some soap on and then you get yourself wet enough to get most of the soap off. The captain of the Silver Side is actually requisitioned for a washing machine to be installed in that compartment. And it's no longer there, but it was there at one point. And so from then on, the crew could wash their clothes while they were at sea, which was probably a big perk for them. Where they dried them, probably would have been in the engine room or somewhere, anywhere in the submarine that was warm, but they could wash their clothes. Um, as you make your way through the watertight bulkhead, you'll find yourself in the forward engine room. There are two engine rooms on board the Silver Sides, and they're, they're pretty much identical to each other, with the exception that they're mirrored images of each other. Each engine room is the home to three diesel engines, believe it or not. Two that you can see, one on the port side, one on the starboard side, and one below the deck in between the port and starboard main engines. So each engine room has three engines. All six engines on board the Silver Sides had simply one job. Um, and this surprises a lot of people. And that one job for these engines would have been to make electricity. They are in no way mechanically coupled to the propeller shafts. They only make electricity. They are just big generators. They create DC power. They can be used to either directly charge the batteries. They can be used to directly power the electric motors that turn the propeller shafts. Hence the name diesel electric submarine. And it's really no different than a diesel locomotive of the same era. And in fact, the engines on board the Silver Sides, which were manufactured by Fairbanks Morris in Chicago, were also used on locomotives of the era. So they were not specially designed for submarines, which surprises a lot of people. And what's really interesting about the engines on board the Silver Sides is not only do they still run, um, and we still do exercise them, but is the fact that Fairbanks Morris is still in business. They still make spare parts for those very engines. Um, and you can actually, if you really want to, still go to a Fairbanks Morris training school and become a certified mechanic for that model of engine. And you, you know, you think to yourself, well, why would anybody do that? But these engines were very versatile. And they were used all over the country, all over the world, really, in stationary power plants. Anywhere that a stationary engine that could turn a generator would be used. So they're really, really, really reliable. They're really robust. And proof of that is in the fact that they still run on board the Silver Sides after 80 years. Perhaps the most important thing, other than the engines in the forward engine room, is what's at the after bulkhead of the forward engine room, and that is the water distillation units. Okay, point to your distillation unit. So here is the chamber, the pump, and the electric motor that turns the pump. On either end, or either side, I guess I should say, of the engine room, there is one water distillation unit. And this is what created all of the fresh water for the crew while they were on patrol, other than the initial fresh water that they brought with them. Okay, and there's heating elements in that chamber? Yes, the chamber is actually two, is split. One half is heated, one half is the condensing chamber. How they worked is they took seawater in from outside, um, inside a chamber there were large electric heaters and essentially the heaters would heat up before you let the seawater in. When you let the seawater in it would flash boil it to steam. Essentially at the top of the chamber would have been an air pump that sucked that steam from the chamber into another chamber that then condensed it down into fresh water 
and the salt that was left in the bottom of the other chamber was then emptied into the bilges and then pumped over the side of the submarine. Yeah, extremely important. This unit is it's probably one of the most important things to sustainability on board the submarine. On board the silver sides there are four freshwater tanks. Each tank is roughly a thousand gallons. So to go out to sea with 80 men with roughly 4,000 gallons of fresh water, reminding yourself of the fact that a lot of the equipment on board the silver sides is actually fresh water cooled doesn't give you much water for very long. So they had to have a way to make fresh water. And that's what the, the distillation units did. Um, now, if these two units were working at full capacity, absolutely nothing was wrong and they could run them all day, in theory, they could probably make close to a thousand gallons of water a day. These two units, as simple as they are, um, made enough fresh water to keep the crew and the submarine functioning for up to 70 days at sea. So they were extremely, extremely important. So every man on board the submarine was trained and qualified on every job from cooking to submerging the submarine to starting the engines. And what, that's what basically they called their qualification process. If they weren't a qualified submariner, um, they were not considered a full blown member of the crew until they passed all of their tests. Um, so as you walk through the after engine room, you'll also notice that the after engine room is the only engine room that has a hatch up top side to the main deck of the silver side. So any large spare parts that had to come in um, that couldn't fit anywhere else or fit through the hatchways inside the boat had to come through the after engine room. Um, if they were too big to fit through the after engine room, they would have to cut a big patch out of the submarine itself called a soft patch. And as you can So basically throughout the sub there are several soft patches. And a soft patch is uh, just a name for um, an area where the men had to cut a hole in the submarine to get something that was either too big or too bulky to get out through a hatchway. Um, so what would happen is they'd cut the hole, they'd get whatever they needed in or out, and then they'd either rivet up the patch, bolt up the patch, or weld up the patch. So if you look up above the engine room here, you'll notice that there's a strengthening plate with a whole bunch of rivets all around. So this tells me that at some point during the Silver Side's life, something catastrophically happened or something big needed to be removed or placed in, which would have been very, very common. But this is how they would have had to get big things in or out of the submarine that didn't fit through hatches, essentially. They needed something for the engine room, they'd first obviously try to bring it down the hatch. You can remove the ladder out of the hatch. Um, and actually, one thing I didn't mention is the deck or the floor that you're walking on, you'll see it's all in, in plates. With screws, it's completely removable including the framework underneath. So if you had something that would physically fit through the hatch but was too long that it would hit the deck, you had another eight feet underneath you that you could use to then swing it up, essentially. So a big job, yes, but a doable job, absolutely, because the deck was completely removable. Now, that's only good to a certain amount, so if you can't get something big, you gotta cut a hole in the side of the, or in the boat. So as you make your way through the after engine room, you will find yourself in the smallest compartment on board the submarine, but also one of the most important. And this is called the maneuvering room. So think of the maneuvering room sort of like the electrical hub for the entire submarine. Uh, you'll walk down a very narrow hallway on the starboard side of the boat, and on your left, or uh, sorry, on the port side of the boat, and on your left, or the, the starboard side, you will see a electrical cage. Now this cage is considered the main bus for the boat not the bus, or yellow one with wheels, it's the electrical bus, basically the electrical hub. Um, so inside that cage are large circuit breakers, um, bus bars, things like that, that could take all of the energy from the generators or the batteries and then distribute them throughout the submarine. So as you walk down this hallway on the port side, um, you will eventually come to a small opening and you will notice that there are handles and levers. Um, along with a lot of different gauges. Now these handles and levers were used to actually distribute the electricity or the energy throughout the sub. So two men would have been stationed on board the Silver Sides in the maneuvering room at all times. These men were considered electricians or their title was electrician. Um, and the thing about the electrician stationed in the maneuvering room is it was very important that they didn't leave their station. Because not only did the maneuvering room 
distribute electricity, but it was also in charge of distributing electricity for the propulsion of the sub. So if the submarine needed to move, the captain would call from the conning tower or whoever was in charge, the XO, give the orders to the men in the maneuvering room who would then execute the order. Very important that those men were on duty at all times, and because of that, they were lucky enough to get their own head or toilet, which is located in the small closed closet on the port side of the boat that's actually shut right now. Underneath the maneuvering room is the motor room, or the electric motor room. So down below are four large electric motors that are then coupled into two reduction gears that actually turn the propeller shafts. So the packing glands, um, the stuffing box, I guess you could say, for the propeller shafts are actually right below the maneuvering room because the propeller shafts exit the bottom of the submarine at the end of the maneuvering room, at the after bulkhead. The final compartment on board the Silver Sides as you walk through the maneuvering room, through the watertight bulkhead, is the after torpedo room. Um, the after torpedo room would have been the home to about 14 men. Um, and also, just like the forward torpedo room, about eight torpedoes. Um, the only difference between the after torpedo room and the forward torpedo room is one, it is set up right now, um, which would have been a late more modification for electric torpedoes. So in the closet on the port side, which is now closed, if you were to open that up, you would find the original battery charger for the electric torpedoes that were fired out of the after torpedo room. Also in the after torpedo room is the steering gear for the rudder of the submarine and the rear dive planes that would have helped the submarine dive while it was underneath the water. The after torpedo room is also different from the forward torpedo room in that it only has four torpedo tubes instead of six tubes. You walk your way up the ladder, you have found that you've walked the entire length of the submarine, which equates to 312 feet. So if you were to place the silver sides on a football field, it would literally extend into each end zone, which is sort of deceiving. Do the propellers spin now? Let me put it this way. Could they spin? Yes. Do they spin? No. And the reason they don't spin is, well, two reasons. First of all, we don't have propellers on it, okay? Uh, the propellers were removed in 1946 from the Silver Sides for a couple reasons. One of them is we have a treaty uh, with Canada left over from the War of 1812 called the Treaty of Ghent, and it basically says that we cannot have um, warships in the Great Lakes that can move under their own propulsion. Another reason that the propellers were removed, though, is that the Silver Sides became a reserve vessel in 1946. Oh, yeah. So it was towed up the Mississippi River through the Chicago River into Lake Michigan, okay, into the Great Lakes. And it sat at Navy Pier in Chicago from 1946 until 1969 as a naval reserve vessel. So what that essentially meant is, is reserve crews would come and learn the ins and outs of being a submariner. Um, and they wanted to be able to use all of the systems on board the submarine um, to do their tests and their drills. And part of that is the propulsion system. So taking the propellers off allowed them to run all of the systems, including the electric motors, um, and not move anywhere. So it never left the pier. So keep in mind that since 1946, the Silver Size has not moved under its own power. It has been towed everywhere. And it has not submerged since 1945. Do the propeller shafts turn? No. Could the propeller shafts turn? Absolutely. We could energize the motors and we could turn the shafts, but we really have no reason and, and the risk to do that wouldn't be worth the reward, I guess, because we couldn't see them turn anyway, other than it'd be really cool. They, we do not operate a lot of those systems, but a lot of systems on board the submarine are still operational or could be made operational, which is really, really neat. Um, and, and like I mentioned earlier, it's one thing to read in a book about a submarine or any vessel or any airplane or anything like that it's another thing to be in it to smell it to to experience the movement to hear the engines rum it, it really does come alive and it, it it makes you feel closer to the men who risk their lives to keep us all safe today on board something like that finding well you know one cool thing that we constantly are doing is you you would never know that a, a vessel that's been sitting for, or that, that has been in private hands, in museum hands for, what, since 1972, would still have original unfound artifacts on it. But constantly when I'm down in the villages looking down there or, or doing maintenance work, I find original World War II, you know, artifacts left over from the original crew members, which is really amazing. Um, so it's, 
it's the best job you know <laughs> you could ever expect to have getting to play with a, I guess if you're interested in history getting to play with a, a World War II vessel and, and help preserve you know. every day my job entails working with American history preserving American history um, educating people on the history of the Silver Sides and not only the Silver Sides but also what the men of previous generations had to go through to keep our nation safe and to make our nation what it is today. So it's really a privilege to preserve and be a part of this organization. Over the past few years we've made a lot of headway with the preservation of the Silver Sides. Um, we're constantly working. We have a very small crew that keeps it up. Our engines are in good running order. Um, a lot of the systems on board are still functional and it's, it's really neat to uh, be able to bring something like the Silver Sides to life. Uh, we hope in the next five years that we're going to bring her to dry dock. Um, and in order to do that, we, we obviously have to raise some money, uh, which we're already working on, but we have to get her across the lake because there's not a dry dock here in, in uh, western Michigan that is large enough to take her. But these are all things that, you know, come with preserving a 70-year-old a vessel. Um, you know, you don't expect to move into a, a, an 80 or 100 year old house and not have to replace the windows. And the same thing is true with the Silver Sides. It was built extremely well, but there's everyday maintenance that we have to keep up on it. Here at the museum, we're, we're honored to have some very, very dedicated volunteers. Um, and, you know, to be honest, some of our volunteers that come here are here as much as the full-time employees that work here, which is really amazing. Yeah, one of these volunteers is named Frank Lydell, and um, he was on uh, a few submarines like the Silver Side, so his knowledge is really indispensable. Um, and it's you know it's my honor and my privilege to be able to work underneath him every day, uh, to you know get a portion of his knowledge every day and learn a little bit more about the Silver Sides every day. And you know most people wouldn't think that climbing in the bilges of a of an 80 year old vessel would be very much fun, but you know, for me and for the rest of the crew here that helps preserve the Silver Sides, this is how you learn about it. Um, you know, it's, it's not a clean job, it's not an easy job, but it's a very, very rewarding job. You know, we are literally taking piece, uh, a piece of American history and keeping it for generations to come. And without men like Frank, um, it would not be possible. Uh, it just simply would not work. So we're, we're grateful for all of our volunteers. We're always looking for more volunteers, so if anybody's interested in volunteering, we'd love to have you. Um, there's plenty of work to do, always, in maintaining the vessel. Um, and on top of that, you, you get to experience and see things that you know most of the general public doesn't see. And of course, it's not for everyone to crawl around in bilges, but for instance, not, not too long ago, we were tracing out some of the air system on board the submarine. Uh, we were in the main cruise quarters, and you would think that a submarine like the Silver Sides, it's been a museum vessel since the early 1970s, and you would think, man, there's nothing left to find. Um, but we were tracing out some of these lines, and it just so happened, jammed between these lines uh, was a, a shard of paper, and I started looking at it, and I looked closer, and I realized it was a whole notebook. And so I started tugging on this, this notebook, trying to get it out, and after about a half hour of fighting, because it's been back there for a really long time, out comes this instruction manual for the original refrigeration system on board the submarine. Okay, well, whoa, that's not too exciting. It's just a refrigeration system manual. But when you open the cover of that refrigeration system manual, there's the name of a sailor, handwritten, with a date of 1941. Okay, so that, that book very likely has been with the Silver Sides on every single one of its war patrols throughout the whole world. Uh, it's been through a lot of different private hands with, with guests coming on board and, and different museum members and, and things like that. And it stayed there. You know, it's, it's literally a time capsule. And although it's just a refrigeration manual, it's really amazing that uh, I'm literally still finding artifacts um, that were untouched from 80 years ago. Um, so, uh, you know, and if you volunteer here, that's something that, you know, you might be able to be a part of. It's, it's really archaeology in, in its, its most basic form because even though we're just down there scrubbing bilges some days and it's not glorious work, there's always something that you can learn. And if you like to learn, this is definitely the place that you can come. Yes, and you know what the funny thing, so last year we had a, the commander of the 7th Fleet come 
And on the same time, we had the, the reenactors come. So all day they were talking about the commanders coming, the commanders coming, the commanders coming. And I, I didn't think twice about it. I, I honestly thought, okay, it's a reenactment commander or something. So in drives this guy in his, <laughs> his full dress whites, gets out of his car. And, and by the way, he was a, re a really super cool, nice guy. Um, and I'm looking at him like, wow, this, this guy really went all out with his reenactment gear, but it turns out it really was the, the commander of the 7th Fleet. So uh, we, we do get very special guests here at the museum, and, and we're honored and privileged that uh, we get a chance to bring them through, <laughs> through a piece of American history. Um, so it's, it's a really, really cool thing. Um, but at this point, it's mostly, you know, cosmetic restoration and things like that that are going into it, and then we keep the things running that um, need to keep yeah, running, essentially. Okay. Below our feet is the pump room, so two air compressors, 50 horsepower each, below, four stage, um, capable of 3,000 PSI. Trim pump, drain pump, hydraulic pump, anything that's basically a pump is below our feet. Um, air conditioning plants, refrigeration plants, everything like that is, is down there. So it's a very uh, cramped space. <laughs> um, it's not a very desirable place uh, yeah. to be, especially at this point. Um, but above our heads is a con, so would you like to go up there yeah. and see it? Yeah, sure. It's under restoration right now, so...